Hello students, my name is Lester Levitt. I'm a graduate assistant at Florida Atlantic University in the uh, School of Public Administration and I'll be your professor this semester for uh, Administrative Process and Ethics, PAD 4604. Uh, welcome you to the class and um, this introductory video will cover very comprehensively the syllabus so that you'll understand exactly what's expected, when it's expected, the assignment due dates are uh, all in there as well uh, as the grading process. So I encourage you to go through the syllabus much more thoroughly than we're going to go through it in this video here um, so that you understand what uh, what's expected for the 16 weeks of this semester. I'm, I'm going to start with a story that isn't related to public administration per se, but I'm going to share it with you so that you understand that um, ethics is a process, um, a process of living one's life in an ethical fashion so that other people are treated with dignity and the respect that they deserve. Um, recently, I, I always follow current news and as you will understand as you get into this course here, you will also be expected to follow current news and share experiences that are very current and happening right now during this semester so that you look at life as being an ethical process. The story that I'm going to share with you is about Michel Dussil, uh, who was a photojournalist, and every story that I heard about him, I did my bachelor's degree at FAU and graduated in 2011 in multimedia journalism. Um, and so I, I understand the ethics of photojournalism very well, and so the story caught my attention, so I followed it. Um, the fellow that I listened to on NPR was saying that Michel Dussil was had the most integrity of any photojournalist that he had ever worked with. The, the, the reason why integrity and ethics is important in photojournalism, especially for somebody who does the work like Michel Dussil does, is that you have to deal with issues like this and, and you have to weigh the balance of whether to photograph a dead body with somebody else walking by and you can photograph it, but whether should that be published? And, and that's an ethical decision. Um, and so this is what um, Michel Dussil said about his, uh, his own experience and how he weighed that judgment out. I've taken pride over my 40 plus years as a photojournalist in offering dignity to subjects I photograph, especially those who are sick or in distress while in front of my camera. My recent photographic assignment to cover the Ebola outbreak in Liberia has proved exceedingly challenging for me. Respect is often the last and only thing that the world can offer a deceased or dying person, yet the camera itself seems to be a betrayal of the dignity I so hope to offer. Sometimes the harshness of a gruesome scene simply cannot be sanitized. How does one give dignity to the image of a woman who has died and is lying on the ground unattended, uncovered, and unalone as people walk by or gaze from a distance? But I believe that the world must see the horrible and dehumanizing effects of Ebola. The story must be told so one moves around with tender care, gingerly, without extreme intrusion. Those are the kinds of decisions that you have to make in public administration as well. The, the administrative process requires those kinds of judgment calls, especially if you are a frontline administrator or a street-level bureaucrat. Um, when they were writing up the obituary of Michel Dussil, they one person told a story of when um, uh, Mr. DeSil spent months photographing life inside a crack house in Miami. The editor on the project was Gene Weingartner, and he writes that after a couple of weeks, I asked him how the shoots were going. He said, no pictures yet. I haven't taken my camera. First comes trust, then comes the work. My own experience with this came while I was doing my capstone project for the uh, my bachelor's degree. Um, I had already been uh, working before I returned to university as a grant writer and an outreach worker for an organization that helped individuals who were struggling with the financial aspects of HIV AIDS. And um, so I was very well known in some of these areas and became known as the white guy on MLK Boulevard during that period of time. So I, I gave my capstone project that title. Um, but it was a situation where I was an outsider and I was definitely visible as an outsider when I would be on the MLK Boulevards of South Florida. And so for my capstone project, I went and surveyed with my camera, primarily, the um, 15 MLK Boulevards that are in Palm Beach County, Broward County, and Miami-Dade County. Um, so that gave me not only uh, the kind of experience where I needed to be very aware of my ethical obligations, um, being a person of privilege, going into these areas and trying to earn the trust of individuals. 
um, who rightfully should be very, very sensitive about somebody coming in from outside. As, they, uh, as one group called them, the, uh, the ladies with pearls who uh, want to give money to inner city organizations but uh, certainly would never ever be um, seen with the people that they're helping. Um, it's kind of the noblesse oblige kind of a sentiment where, oh, it's the noble's obligation. And um, but so they want to be seen as doing good, but they don't want to be seen with the people that they help. So you have an ethical obligation to avoid that kind of a relationship where you're coming in as this father figure. And, and we call that paternalism on MLK Boulevard. And it's something that you um, will deal with um, in public administration. Um, when you're dealing with class situations, that uh, where class is definitely a barrier to the equitable distribution of public goods and services. So, as part of my work with the as, um, um, with my capstone project, it grew into what would become my PhD degree. Um, I was accepted into the PhD program while in the middle of a two-year-long participant observation study on uh, in in Liberty City. Miami's inner city neighborhood that is over 90% black. And so when I worked with Liberty City, um, there were over 20 um, outlets for public goods and services along a 15 block stretch of MLK Boulevard. And so I surveyed and I made a map of all of these public assets that were part and parcel of public administration um, in Liberty City. And, and so my work has now evolved to the point where I'm trying to get these organizations to work more closely with each other. But I still have to be very aware of the fact that I'm an outsider doing this work, and so I have to avoid that paternalism that um, hails back to centuries here in the United States of the white man doing what's right for the um, African American population. And so we've got to get around that. It has to be an ethical approach. Um, and that's where the administrative process comes in. So that's what I want to teach this semester to you. One thing I do want to share with you is one experience that I had, and, and it's, this is part of that building trust process which um, Michel Ducil talked about. When I was uh, on MLK Boulevard in Pompano Beach, I saw this store, it's the Uptown Market. Uh, many of you will recognize it if you're from the Pompano Beach area. Um, but I found these individuals out front sitting and I parked my car and it looked fairly safe for me to actually do that in that neighborhood. There are certain neighborhoods where it would not have been safe. Uh, I took the pictures out the windows of my car. So I parked my car and I got out and I approached these six individuals that were sitting in front of the store. I uh, did not take pictures um, without asking permission. So first off, what I did was I had my audio recorder and um, so I asked them if I could record a conversation with them because I'm a university student and I'm looking at uh, at certain things that are happening along MLK Boulevard in Pompano Beach. And I started up a conversation with the, these men. And I just want you to listen to this conversation um, to uh, understand the uh, process of the, that I actually used. I, I, I talked to a guy named Smokey. I don't, I don't know if you know a Smokey. Yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. I, I caught Smokey down in front of the Sunshine Health Cl Clinic and I said, well, next I'm going to go to Liberty City. And he goes, wouldn't you rather go to Richmond Heights? You go to Liberty City, but you don't want to go you there. Don't go there. Not, not, not. I, I've worked with nonprofit organizations. Yeah. For, uh, I'm, I'm actually going for my master's in nonprofit. Yeah. And, uh, I management. Love you, man. and I, yeah. I've been, I dropped off the careful. freeway That's there and I went down to the community center, which is right on the metro rail. Yeah, I do. You know, so yeah. You go around Liberty City, man. Be careful. Yeah, be careful. You go to Liberty City. You go to Liberty City. Be careful. Yeah, and uh, no. people have told me not to pick a crowd in front of a store no. and stop and talk no. to them. There. You might want to individualize that. Yeah. Don't do it. Yeah. I think I'll, I'll stick right, in, uh, right to the community yeah. center and get them oh, yeah. in the front line. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Yeah, anyway, if you do. Take a couple of black guys with you, you know what I mean? Yeah, and that's yeah, where you yeah. might get yeah, a chance. Might, uh, uh, maybe I'll take the guy from Muncie in the end. Yeah, he, yeah, might, yeah. he might be my. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That way you can ask questions, you know. How about Overton? What's the Overton area like? Well, Overton's not, not that bad. It's kind of that same city. It's yeah. not as bad. It's, it's not as bad. bad. It's not as bad as Liberty City. Liberal Town. Yeah. You know, we can ask a lot of folks. So, so what would fix Liberty City? What would it take to uh, not go down that Liberty City? City. Yeah. Some real strong law enforcement, they, they got the a bomb. <laughs> yeah, they got the they got the basement. Oh, that's that's the Atlantic the country. Those guys yeah. playing like they're doing cops and robbers. You know, Southern. 
you had the word genocide, pro yep. black, yep. blah, blah, that's yep. what the whole uh, issue is. You know, they're looking to jack, they're looking to take, they're looking to rob, they're looking to steal, all this shit, man. And that's what they're them If you're going to do that, they come down here. If you're going to do that, you know what you do? Down here is all. Get your fat pants and take all your pockets out. Don't take no wallet, don't take no wallet, no nothing. This way, don't take my car. No, you going to take your car, but you got to be Lock it. Somewhere way over somewhere. <laughs> well, no, we're serious, man. These guys no, down there, they, it's not a joke. No. They're you not stupid, but it. you know what I mean? They're, 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 you know, you've heard it's, it. it's a poverty thing out there. You know what I mean? Now, 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 everybody now, wants money, but nobody wants to work for money. You know, you think everybody you got something to be a gangster, man. Yeah, my, if I throw it out on him, I can get a little something. You know what I mean? Because now, to a certain extent, as far as the summary, it has money, drugs, blah, 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 a lot of young black people, you know what I'm saying, issues, and they try to hold strong that, and they empower themselves on a black issue, and they, they just yeah. So after this conversation, I asked the men if I could run across the street and take a picture, and so I did get their permission to take this picture. But the interesting thing about this conversation was what was um, what they mentioned to me about the building across the street. Um, I apologize, I don't have a picture of the building across the street, but it did have a small fire in it. It was where the barbershop was, and if you're from a black neighborhood, you'll understand the significance of a barbershop. Um, and they were talking about how the city wanted to destroy this building. They wanted to demolish this building. Now, you got to understand, on MLK Boulevard, uh, just about any MLK Boulevard, there's already lots and lots and lots of vacant lots. Um, so that comes about because of the decades of redlining where banks would not lend any money and insurance companies would not insure businesses if they were located on MLK Boulevard um, because unfortunately many of them got burned down in South Florida um, and insurance companies were on the hook for those um, because of the rioting and so as a result insurance companies are very reluctant to even insure buildings became very reluctant in that period after the 1960s and 70s and 80s even to insure any property on an in an inner city neighborhood and the banks wouldn't lend money against them either and so the city wanted to demolish this building that it had a small fire in the back that also the only business left in it that was able to survive was the barber shop um, but it was a big two-story building and so the um, city was saying they're going to de destroy it and these men were very upset about that and I didn't understand the significance of that until a couple of years later when I realized in one little part of this conversation which I held with these individuals, they mentioned that that's where the barbecues were held in the parking lot behind this building. So in the hot summer days, they would actually be in the shade of the building. And, um, and the barbecue had been there for 15 years, I think, if I remember the conversation correctly. And so the idea that they would lose this building, even though it only held a barbershop in one little portion that wasn't damaged by the fire, was very upsetting to these individuals because they knew number one it would only going to it would only be re, it would not be replaced it would be become another vacant lot which is not suitable for a barbecue in August in uh, South Florida and um, and and so that was their big push um, the importance of barbecues on the MLK boulevards and in the inner city and black neighborhoods of South Florida is not understood by City Hall and so a City Hall that tries to do the paternalistic thing and say, we know what's best for you, that building's unsafe, we need to demolish it. Don't think about things like a barbecue that's been held for 15 years in the back parking lot. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we're going to learn about in this semester here, is how to deal with that. Also, another thing that we're gonna understand is the ethical process, the administrative process that comes out of running a city, um, like Ferguson, Missouri. What what how did jaywalking lead to a police shooting? Um, these are all questions which, if you look at the facts that are in front of you, then you may come up with a conclusion much like the grand jury did in Ferguson, Missouri, and the grand jury did also in the uh, chokehold death in New York City. Um, so these protests are not because of police brutality directly. You can argue that, and many people do, because that's very superficial and it's a very easy argument. The problems are decades old, centuries old, and the problems have to do with the structural dynamics of race relations in the United States. And so this, this is just an introduction to what you're going to be dealing with this semester, is the administrative process has to go back decades and right many, many wrongs that have led up to the current situation where police 
overreact to black teenagers and black males, in specifically, um, because they're they they have listened to narratives in their head that tell them that this is a very dangerous situation and they need to react to it um, with force, and so that's part of a structural dynamic that is embedded, deeply embedded, in public administration. And we, as people who are, you as students who are going to graduate with a bachelor's degree, are going to come out of this class understanding this a little bit better, and you're going to be the one that's going to have to stop the conversation when it talks about um, police brutality or uh, something else that's an outcome of a flawed process. And you're going to have to teach justice and fairness and how you're going to have to be able to weigh the whole story so that you understand that it was jaywalking that led to this police shooting. Michael Brown is dead because he was jaywalking. People will argue, no, he's dead because he stole cigarillos. No, um, Michael Brown is dead because the policeman was a rookie. Um, no, the actual circumstances were he was jaywalking, which is what caused the policeman to stop him. Now, what told that policeman to stop a black kid for jaywalking when that policeman in a white neighborhood would have probably just kept driving, that's the administrative process that is flawed. This broken windows theory idea that is only enforced in poor neighborhoods and never enforced with equal weight in rich neighborhoods and affluent neighborhoods um, is, the process, is the problem. Police are being told that they have to enforce really low-level crimes like jaywalking in a poor neighborhood, whereas they can ignore low-level crimes in a rich neighborhood, primarily because they never even patrol the rich neighborhoods, because they're patrolling the poor neighborhoods with this idea of enforcing low-level crimes. Community policing says that you get to know this kid so that when you see him jaywalking, you can say, Michael, get off the road, you know better than that, rather than make it confrontational and deteriorate the relationship between a certain class of people so that they have no respect for the police because the police are not treating them with justice and fairness. When you do not get justice and fairness on the streets of Ferguson, because the police treat you differently because of where you live and because of the color of your skin, then you have no reason to have any respect for the police, which is why you jaywalk in the middle of the street because it's kind of your way of thumbing your nose at the man. And so, if you understand that as part of the process, then you've got, you're, then you're already a long way into understanding what this course is going to be about. So let's move on to the syllabus here. Um, if you need appointments with me, um, I can meet you on campus if you're already on campus for other classes. Um, I could meet you in the reading room. It's the PhD cohort reading room, SO117, uh, which is, if you know where the dean's office is for the College for Design and Social Inquiry, there's a little corridor to the right of that, um, of the dean's office, and you go to the second entrance and turn in, and the PhD reading room is there. So we can meet in the reading room. I don't have an office on campus, so it also works for me if you want to text me, find out if I can call you, or we can set up a Skype conversation. Um, you have my permission to text me 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. I have enough sense to turn my ringer off when I go to bed at night, so you don't need to worry about when you finish your homework. If it's 2 in the morning, you can send um, any part of that that needs to be sent to my phone. Um, when you're done with it. You don't have to say, oh, I'm going to have to remember that tomorrow and then forget. When you're done at 2 in the morning, send it to me. Um, after you finish watching this video, send me a picture of yourself that I can use and you will uh, see what I'm going to use that for. Um, so it doesn't matter. When you're thinking about it, if it's um, something that you need to send to my phone, send it. Um, so that phone number is free to use to set up appointments to see me, to submit your homework to it. Um, if it can't be submitted to uh, Blackboard. Um, so that's part and parcel of how I run the course, which is probably very different than any other professor you've ever had. The textbook is by C.E. Johnson. It's a 2015 textbook, go figure. Um, you already got the brand new, it's finally, when I'm recording this video, it's 2014 and we've already got the 2015 textbook. By the time you take the class, that 
textbook will be absolutely current for it. This is what the textbook looks like if you see it on Amazon, you want to order it now, um, go ahead and get it coming. Um, there are, uh, that's the fifth edition of the textbook. So if, uh, if you see a previous version for really cheap on uh, Amazon, you're probably okay ordering a previous version of it. In the syllabus, there is an optional textbook listed. Um, it's optional. Um, it, it, the, only, the only reason why you'd ever need to order that textbook is if you uh, wanted to have it on your bookshelf. Because what we're going to do instead of referring to the textbook is we're going to be referring to the videos that Michael Sandel um, recorded. He is a Harvard professor and um, they have 12 episodes of his lectures up online that you can view for free. Um, here's the hyperlink to it right here at uh, justiceharvard.org. They're professionally recorded, very well put together, and easy to watch. They're one hour long each. So as part of Unit Zero, I need you to watch episodes 11 and 12. We're starting at the end of this video series, and um, I'll tell you more about that at the uh, end of this video here. Um, so you don't need to order the second textbook unless it's something you really want on your bookshelf. Um, all of the references, citations that we do, I want you to consult um, one of the best places I've found is the Radford University's APA 6th resource for citing really weird and unusual things. Um, it seems that as part of the courses that I teach, um, we end up getting into things where um, outside of the peer-reviewed sources, everything that we write in uh, your research project needs to have two peer-reviewed sources. But outside of peer-reviewed sources, I expect citations for everything else you find, including your current events. So, so there are some really weird and unusual um, things that come up on the internet that are really difficult to cite. And that's why I use the Radford Guide, is because the Radford Guide helps you do those really weird and unusual online citations. The assessments for this course um, are going to be made up of participation points. Part and parcel of the participation points will be getting your own introduction up. So get your introduction up there so that when I am dealing with something and I forget who you are, I've got 31 students, I think, in the class this semester, so I'm not going to remember everything about all 31 of you, um, especially since we'll never meet in the classroom. I want to be able to go to this discussion board and find out a little bit about you so that I can remember something about you while I'm grading your paper because uh, you'd be surprised at how much um, easier it is to grade a person's work if I understand a little bit more about where that person's coming from and where they're writing, um, what lens they see the world through. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Don't get too personal because everybody else is going to read it. Um, but it would be nice to know um, where you grew up, um, where you live now, uh, neighborhood-wise. Um, and. Um, uh, a little bit more about your whether you're married, have any children, if you want to share that, that would be fine. The class participation, I'm going to have to change this in the syllabus. It's actually not class participation, but there are 10 points uh, connected to that introductions. Um, but also, because we're not in a class environment, I have participation points triggers. Um, and you'll see on the uh, Blackboard site where some of these triggers will come in and you uh, make submissions. And um, in some cases, the triggers only have a 48-hour response window to them. Um, so I do this because as a 100% online course, there's a high propensity of losing students who only log on every two weeks and then they binge on the homework. Um, that's not the best way to do this class. I want you to take this class seriously as, as seriously as you would a classroom-based class. I want you to be involved in it continuously on a process throughout the semester. I don't care if you work ahead. I can absolutely work with you if you want to um, finish this class by the end of March. Um, there's ways that you can do that. But I'm not going to allow you to wait until the beginning of March to start the class. Um, these participation points triggers are my way of ascertaining whether I'm losing a student who is um, unintentionally um, in the process of falling out of the system. So watch for these. Check your email every 48 hours. Uh, otherwise, you may miss some of these participation points triggers, which will make up 10% of your final grade. Um, this is where you'll find them. All of your submissions are done through these links here that you see in this yellow circle. Um, the first link that you will get when you get up into there are the um, participation points triggers um, is the introduce yourself and a selfie um, for five participation points out of a total of 100. Now, there's 10 points, 10% of your final grade 
is uh, based on participation. That 10% is going to be made up of 100 points. Um, so that's how this is going to work. If you have your picture on your computer, you can attach it to the email and send it that way. If you don't have your picture on the computer but you have it on your cell phone, you can text it to me. Um, so they, uh, there's two ways to get your selfie picture to me. Um, and keep in mind, I'm going to use that selfie picture as part and parcel of some of the class participation. What, what I do to substitute for class participation will require that your I have a picture of you that I can put into an embed in a video like you're seeing now. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Sunday summaries. There are 20 points. 20% 20 of your final grade will be made up of 10 assignments worth two points each. Um, I call them the Sunday summary because I expect them every Sunday by 11.59 p.m. Um, if you don't want to do, you have two options to submit this. Uh, one option is that you can do an analytical sub summary that's about two pages long and all it does is it picks a topic and you do a two-page write-up about that topic. But um, for some of you who are really averse to technology, that may be a faster process. But I believe for those of us who understand technology, it may actually be faster to choose option number two here, uh, which is to do a current events example and tell me what you need, what you understand from that. And tell me how that current event news piece um, illustrates something about what you just read that week as part of the learning unit. You can read this in detail. I don't want to take up time on the video, um, but I believe it will save you homework time. Um, all I really need is a, um, if you wanted to do a PowerPoint where you record an audio over three or four slides where you can do screen captures, drop up on a PowerPoint slide, tell me a little bit about why you chose that and what topic it relates to, um, that would be fine. You can send me the PowerPoint with the embedded audio in it. I just want to hear you talking. You are not allowed to put more than 10 typed words on a slide that are words that you compose. You can do a screen capture that has lots of words or a headline or something like that. But as far as reading off of the slide, that's a big no-no. And I will dock points if you just read off the slide. I want to hear your voice talking to me about this event news story, whatever it is that you captured that week that illustrates something that you learned that week. And that's why I call them the Sunday Summary. If you're going to do a PowerPoint, don't forget to put your name and your photo on the title slide. Um, and also, if you don't have, if you don't think you have the current version of PowerPoint where it has the audio recording function for the slides, uh, think again because as part of the deal that FAU negotiated with Microsoft, every student at FAU now gets to download and install Office 365 on their computer, which also includes um, OneDrive which is a cloud resident storage facility, um, for all of your data. And I've got that on my computer. You'll be absolutely amazed at how it changes the way you think about computing. So I encourage you to get Office 365. Um, but if you really, really hate PowerPoint and you opt for option number B here to submit a multimedia format, um, you can either do a short YouTube video where you just hold things up like I'm doing now, hold the newspaper up or show, have the video capture your computer screen. Um, and you can talk about a current news event while you're just pointing to your computer screen or holding up an iPad. Um, I don't care what it is as long as it is a short little summary that I get to listen to with my ears. Um, you can also just record a memo on your cell phone and text it to me. So grab your cell phone, find the memo function, record the memo, um, and uh, as soon as you're done recording, hit send. But if you do the YouTube or the audio memo function, you do need to send me a document that I can actually look at on Blackboard. So you have to still go to Blackboard and on the Sunday summary you need to click on the week where you're submitting it and upload a quick title page that has your name, um, what you did, um, whether you did a YouTube video and there's a hyperlink to the YouTube video. Don't ever send me the video. Put the video up on YouTube, send me the hyperlink. Blackboard does not like uploading videos. My cell phone does not like receiving videos longer than six seconds. So if you're doing a YouTube video, send me the hyperlink. List all of the section headings or, in the case of the videos, the um, abstract points about what uh, Michael Sandel covered in his lecture video. Um, and um, tell me which 
section heading point, which major point it is that you uh, have opted to talk about, and then send me the hyperlink to the news story so that I can actually pull up the hyperlink while I listen to your audio. Um, so either way, you'll learn this fairly quickly just by doing it the first time. So the first one will be due on January 11th, um, and there's 10 of them, and you'll see when each one of these are due in the course schedule in the syllabus. There will be two quizzes this semester, um, worth 10 points each, 10 percentage points of your final grade uh, will be from each quiz. Um, you can look at the course schedule, find out when they will be held. They will be online, of course. Uh, the material will be taken entirely from my own video lectures. So these video lectures here will be what will be on the quiz. So if you think you're going to do well by just reading the textbook and not watching the videos that I prepare, uh, you'll be sorely disappointed because what you will find is that I treat this as a classroom class. So I am as though you, you need to think of this as me standing in front of a class giving a lecture and the quizzes will be from my lectures, not from what you read. Um, so you need to watch these videos, you need to pay attention to these videos, probably take notes um, and while you're watching the video mark down the minute mark in case you need to come back to it. So if you take a page and you write down um, Professor Levitt said this at 22 minutes 30 seconds, then you can actually come back and refresh your memory about what I said at the 22 minute mark. And, um, and, and I will also reference the PowerPoint slides that show up on these videos um, and I'll make those available to you in most cases so that you can actually have the PowerPoint slides to jog your memory about what I covered off in my lecture. The paper and presentation is worth 30% of your final grade. So you must submit a well-written and researched 9 to 10 page paper. We call it a case study, alternatively paper, um, alternatively a presentation. Um, proposing your topic will be something you earn participation points on, so that'll be under the participation points triggers. Um, I need an outline of the paper, that'll be worth 5 points, 5% 5 of your final grade. I need an almost finished draft, and by mean when you see the word draft, don't think of draft in the sense of, oh, okay, it can be really rough. No, this needs to be almost finished because I'm going to grade this um, with a lot of weight, and that way you'll have a much better final paper if it is almost finished at stage three here. So the almost finished draft is worth eight points. Your multimedia PowerPoint presentation is worth nine points and your final paper is worth another eight points. So that's how your research paper will be graded. Um, this research paper will dominate the second half of the semester, getting this ready. Uh, we will be done the textbook um, by week uh, 10 or 11, and so then the last three or four weeks are entirely focused on getting this paper and presentation together. And then the final exam will be worth 20% of your final grade. I give unlimited time for it. I will give you the questions where there's a written response um, 10 days in advance so that you can spend all the time that you need preparing a good, well thought out response to the questions. Um, because this is the final exam and it's right at the end of the semester, there's no makeup exam, of course. So there's a summary of where your grade will come from. And um, you need to get a C or better if you end up with a C minus. Um, I will be offering, I'll be watching very, very carefully in the final month as well to see which one of you are at risk of getting below a C minus, C minus or below. And if I see you are in this range here of 70 to 74 percent, I will be offering makeup work so that you can uh, lift your grade to a C because the most heartbreaking thing a professor ever has to do is give somebody a 72 percent when the course is required for graduation. So. Uh, this is how the course schedule is laid out for you. Complete my column is the most important column to pay attention to. Um, these are the unit numbers over here, um, so you'll understand them on the Blackboard um, organization. The way the Blackboard is organized is by learning units. Um, they need to be completed by these dates or sooner. Like I mentioned, you can also work ahead. Um, and where we are right now is the introductory instructor introduction and the Sandell episodes 11 and 12. Um, this is the last half of the semester here. Spring break comes in um, from March 2nd to 8th, so um, there's nothing due on March 8th. And the final exam will be held sometime in the week of April 23rd to 29th. I haven't actually picked that date yet, but it'll be in the exam week. When you open up Blackboard, you will see Start Here, and um, that will bring you to this page here. 
and the way you work through this learning unit, and, and this is the way the other learning units will be structured as well, I'll tell you what to do as far as the video goes. Um, here there's any files that you need, in this case it's a syllabus, you can download the syllabus by clicking on the link here. Before unit one is done, you will have done all of these steps here. And uh, here's a little bit about me, and below this there's all kinds of stuff that will help you through learning Blackboard, getting adapted to an online course. If, if this is your first online course, I doubt it, but uh, it will tell you a little bit more if you've never thought deeply about how to use Blackboard effectively. There's a lot of tools on this page down below um, that uh, will help you learn Blackboard much more effectively. So when you reach this section here, this tells you what you must complete before you are done the unit, the learning unit. So the last thing you need to do here, point number five, is watch episodes 11 and 12 of the Justice with Michael Sandell lectures. That will appear in another format here in the course schedule. So if you look at the learning unit on the course schedule, it also has a very similar list here about what you need to read, listen to, or view. Um, in this case, read the syllabus, read the course schedule, understand, watch this video, which is an introductor, instructor introduction, and then Sandell episodes 11 and 12. So there's two different ways of understanding what to do, one on Blackboard, one in the syllabus. So let's start to understand a little bit about the um, Justice with Michael Sandel video series. Um, this is the page you go to um, and, uh, and you should be able to uh, find the hyperlink that will get you to the watch episodes pull down tab. So this watch episodes tab here um, will allow you access to all 12 episodes. So we're going to start with episode 11 and episode 12, um, which I, I've, I've chosen to start with the finish because what he captures in those two episodes um, puts your mind in the framework of what he's going to talk about through the episodes 1 through 10. Um, it, I've watched them myself. They, they, don't, they will make a lot of reference to what he had talked about earlier, like um, Aristotelian ideas and um, Kantian ideas. Uh, John Rawls, you'll hear those words, but you don't need to understand them at this point in time in order to really gain what he's getting at with episode 11 and 12. So he's making a very, very good argument with episode 11 and 12 that will probably leave a lot of questions in your mind, and there's not, nothing about episodes 11 and 12 that are going to be on an exam anywhere. It's, it's about changing the way you see the world, and that's what episode 11 and 12 should do, is allow you to stand back and say, oh my goodness, I've never seen the world that way before. And then episodes 1 through 10 will actually help you gain a foundation of understanding why it makes sense to take that different look at the world. And the way you even live your own life now becomes recontextualized as part of an administrative process that bears in mind constantly the ideas of justice and fairness and what it means for pe different people to live the good life. Um, and and, what, and you, you should be able to self-examine your own worldview and understand that there's a lot of things in your worldview that are standing in the way of other people living happy and full lives. Because what you thought you wanted, you thought was good for everybody, and now you're all of a sudden understanding that people live by a different truth than you do. So your worldview may define truth with a capital T, and you may be Christian, but somebody else who is an atheist has a very different truth. And so your belief in Christianity cannot interfere with their right to not believe in Christianity. And so that's what these 12 video series will do, is they will teach you and walk you through the ethical dilemmas that are part and parcel of public life, especially if you are in a position of administrative responsibility, which you will be by the time you graduate. So that's what these videos are all about. That's how they integrate together. When I talk about different worldviews, um, classic example, we love satire. Some of the most popular TV shows on today are comedic satire. And, and, and we will make fun of other people who have different worldviews from us. And so here's Jon Stewart making fun of Dick Cheney's position on the idea that he would, if he had it to do over again, resort to torture techniques, which came out in all our gory detail in the last couple of months. And, and so Jon Stewart disagrees with Dick Cheney, and a lot of us do disagree with what Dick Cheney did. And a lot of us would 
pale at the thought of ever doing again what Dick Cheney spearheaded while he was vice president. So from an ethical standpoint, there's a very, very good argument for what Dick Cheney did, and there's a very good argument to never ever allow to happen again what J Dick Cheney instigated. And that's what the Justice with Michael Sandel videos will walk you through. He, he did his lectures and recorded the lectures in 30 minute blocks. So each one of the episodes is part one, part two. So they're each an hour long. Um, here's the start points of episode one, and episode, part one, part two, in this episode. And so in episode 11, part one, he's gonna talk about the claims of community. Part two, he's gonna talk about where our loyalties lie whether you're loyal to Dick Cheney or whether you're loyal to another point of uh, thinking, a way of thinking like John Stewart. Episode 12 is part one, debating same-sex marriage. Part two is defining the good life. So that's why we're starting with these very um, universal wrap-ups. He's used these four lectures, two episodes, to wrap up everything that he's talked about in the previous 10 episodes. And so these two episodes will capture that, put them nicely, tie them with a bow. And uh, so then that sets you off to be able to go back and start with episode one next week. That's it for this video lecture. Um, I hope you really enjoy the course. Um, it's a very challenging, personally challenging for a lot of people to have to rethink their own worldview with the idea that there may be multiple truths. But as people who are studying social sciences, as we all are, uh, we need to understand this as a very central concept um, that we don't define truth. We have truth as a social construct in our lives. Each one of us have worldviews that are uniquely our own. Each one of us have cultures that are uniquely our own. And we need to govern ourselves and we need to run an administrative process that allows for those multiple truths to coexist. Um, and that is at the very part of the social equity goal of public administration. The goal of public administration is that everybody participates equally in the public sphere. And that's what this course is about, is putting together an administrative process that protects the good life, no matter how people define it for their own personal lived experience. Thanks.